Okay, so I uh, had a little interruption for the, uh, the beginning of the show. Uh, my guest for this show is Salvador Babonas. Uh, he's an American sociologist based in Sydney, Australia, and, and the author of the book, The New Authoritarianism, Trump Populism, and the <clears throat> Tyranny of Experts. <laughs> Thanks for the plug. It's a pleasure. Uh, and this is a continuation of the interview that that was interrupted. So anyway, uh, I wanted to get your idea about the difference between rights and freedoms. Oh, political philosophers have poured a million gallons of ink on this one, and I want to keep it really simple. A freedom is something you have. A right is something you're given. I have the freedom of speech because I'm an American. And in the Constitution, we said the government will not infringe on the freedom of speech. It's our right, uh, so it's our freedom, and they can't come and interfere with our freedom. Europeans have the right of freedom of speech. That is, in the Treaty of Rome, they gave people the right to speak their mind, except where the government finds it necessary to prohibit them for reasons of state security. They have a right to freedom of speech. A right is given you by somebody and can be taken away again by somebody. A freedom is something you started with and never lost. And our freedoms as Americans go all the way back to Magna Carta and they're lost in the mists of time as, uh, uh, as Edmund Burke uh, wrote you know, more than 200 years ago about you know, his freedoms, which are based on the old Anglo-Saxon freedoms before the Normans even came uh, to England. We don't know where they came from, but we continue to have them. A right is something new and created, and we've seen a big transition over the last 200 years from basic freedoms in America. You know, I can speak what I want. I can worship who I want. You know, I can do whatever job I want. You know, I don't have to, you know, everything except the, the big non-freedom slavery, right, the, the great American original sin. But we had freedoms in America. Increasingly, over the last 200 years, we've added to that rights. For example, you have a right to uh, an income tax credit if your income falls below a certain level. You have a right to have medical treatment in an emergency at a hospital. You, know, you have a right to unemployment insurance. Now, I don't think rights are all bad. <laughs> I think we need these rights in a modern society. Uh, but there's a big difference between freedoms, I can just do what I want, and rights which create a claim on somebody else. If I have a right to unemployment insurance, somebody has got to pay the taxes to support that right. If I have a right to medical care, someone's got to actually provide that medical care to me. Rights create an obligation on somebody else. Freedoms don't. And this is part of your issue with the expert authoritarianism. How is that? Oh, because experts are the only people who can define rights. Experts are always finding new rights. For example, the, let, let's take a, a, a sterling example that is you know, really controversial. A woman's right to an abortion in the United States. It, where does that come from? Uh, well, you know, it comes from a, a group of experts, the Supreme Court, who found that right in the Constitution, where frankly, you know, I don't see it in the Constitution. I think a lot of people don't see it in the Constitution. Now, I've written an entire essay, you know, published it in a book chapter on why women should have a right to an abortion, and it should be legislated by Congress, and it's the only sane social policy to have. Uh, but, you know, where do these rights come from? You know, the Supreme Court found the right in the ether, plucked out of the ether, said, you know, people have to have this right, and we're going to give it to them. Let, I give you lots of other examples. You know, refugee rights. Uh, does someone have a right to go to the U.S. border? And this is very practical, very topical today. Can someone from Central America show up at the U.S. border and claim a number in line in the U.S. asylum processing system, which will take two or three years to resolve? Well, that's a right defined by experts who put it in, first of all, into um, United Nations uh, Convention on Refugees. They got it put into U.S. law. Uh, now, by getting into U.S. law, Congress people did vote on it. There's an element of democracy there, but no U.S. election has ever been fought on that issue before. You know, maybe fought on that issue in the next one. Uh, you know, experts define what sort of rights people should have. 
not all the time. I'm not saying there's a clear line. Experts always do it. I'm saying that experts have continually expanded the list of rights that people have. And that those are not typically democratically mandated. That is, experts say that you have a human right to something because, you know, simply because you're human or simply because, you know, that's the way it should be. And I think that's, that is the heart of authoritarianism. I mean, look, I believe in universal health care. And I want us to go to an election in 2020 and elect someone who will give us universal health care. But I don't want... Well, you get it in Australia where you're living. Oh, I have it in Australia where I live, and it's wonderful. Every society should have it. It's the only civilized thing to do about health care. But I don't want an unelected body to decide, or a remotely elected body like the Supreme Court, to decide that it transgresses someone's basic human right not to be provided with health care. Now, you know, that's how I, I would like to see these things implemented democratically. Bottom up, the people vote for it. I think experts should go to the people and make their case and try to convince people. But I don't want it to be forced on people. I'll give you another very topical example, the gay wedding cake case. Uh, you know, the American Civil Liberties Union has a long history of standing up for people who you know, have their freedoms and rights trampled by government. And you know, they're there for the unpopular people. They defended you know, racists and Nazis in the 1920s and 1930s. These were unpopular people who still should get a right to a fair trial, who still should have freedom of speech. What happened with the gay wedding cake case? Well, a gay couple wants to buy, wants to commission a wedding cake, not just buy one in a store off the shelf, wants to commission one. The baker says, I'm an artist. You can't force me to make this cake. I have the freedom to choose which cakes I make and which cakes I don't. The baker said, you can buy one off the shelf. Okay, they weren't denied service. They were simply denied you know, the, the right to force someone to make the cake. Okay. Now, I think this case tells you everything. The American Civil Liberties Union took the side of the gay couple. Now, there are good reasons why gays should, be, uh, should have the ability to buy wedding cakes. But when things come up you know, to a one versus the other, when someone's freedom is up against someone else's right, you know, I, I'm for the freedoms. Uh, the experts increasingly are for the rights. Uh, staying on uh, homosexuality and homophobia, America was moving towards gay marriage, right? State after state was holding referendum and embracing gay marriage because, you know, attitudes have changed. And most Americans today understand that, you know, who you sleep with or who you want to have a relationship with, that's a, that's a real relationship that, you know, there's nothing fake or, you know, disreputable about homosexual relationships. <laughs> and Americans were coming around to that point of view. And state after state was democratically voting to embrace gay marriage. That process was cut short when the United States Supreme Court, supported by amicus briefs from all sorts of rights organizations, uh, found, a, found a right to gay marriage in the U.S. Constitution. So you don't think there should be any federal laws that grant rights? It should all be done at a state level? Why not? Well, there certainly should be st federal laws that grant rights. But I want to see as much as possible done through the political system to be fought over and argued politically and be you know, transparently voted on in Congress. I want as few things as possible to be decided by expert commissions. You know, what, what, I, I've been re refraining from mentioning it, but the Pirate Party, are you familiar with the Pirate Party? Yes, very much, yep. And I think that really one of the central ideas of the Pirate Party is that it delegates to people so that if you're a member of the Pirate Party, you can tell a, a, some level of a representative that you delegate to them to make a decision on this issue. And it goes up and up. Right. But I, th I think that kind of a concept of representative democracy is much closer to what you're describing. Oh, look, there are all sorts of clever ways to aggregate viewpoints. Uh, but uh, honestly, and, and here's where I'm conservative, uh, I'm not a conservative when it comes to gay marriage, I'm not a conservative when it comes to abortion, I'm not a conservative when it comes to unions, but I'm a conservative when it comes to political institutions. And there I'm entirely with Edmund Burke, who said, you know, we have institutions that have evolved, that work, and he wrote in, in his book on the uh, on his letter against the revolution in France, that the problem with France, and he wrote before the terror in France, 
was that you can't create a whole new society from scratch from first principles. Because look what happens when you do. You, know, you, you, have, uh, you have to have things come organically through history and society for them to work. I have nothing against Pirate Party. It's a clever idea. You know, I'd like to see parties try that out. And who knows, maybe in 50 or 100 years, our system will work that way. I certainly well, wouldn't want to let you of, You're talking about embracing incrementalism. Yes, very much. Uh, because I think institutions that work, work for a reason. In our representative democracy, where we elect people to make policies on our behalf, basically works. It's been around for more than 200 years. It's been extremely stable. We have the second oldest constitution in the world at this point. Only England has an older constitution than ours. So old, it's not even written down. Yet, yet our constitution up until about 40 years ago was the most popular one to be adopted by other nations. And it stopped being that because it's archaic at this point. And we're stuck with stuff like a Senate that it creates totally disproportional representation that we'll never get rid of because of the entrenched power. See, I would take the Burkean point of view. There's a good reason for the Senate and the reason it's worked so well, because it forces consensus in America to have to be made not only in the interest of the majority, House of Representatives, but also in the interests of sectional viewpoints. So you can't, you can't get things through the Senate that are going to trample all over what people think throughout the South and Midwest. Or, through, or you can't do it if they're going to trample over what people think in New England and the West Coast, right? You, you have to have, you know, both principles work well together. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying that you couldn't come up with other systems. I'm saying I wouldn't give up a system that works really well. I mean, I think Americans sometimes think that, you know, the U.S. is some kind of catastrophe when America is, you know, the best functioning country in the world. Uh, you know, I wouldn't give up something that works so well on a theoretical principle. You know, that, that's the route to the French Revolution. All right, so you know, we talked about this before we started the <clears throat> on air part. What's your politics? I, I mean, are you a conservative or are you, where, where do you stand? Oh, I, I'm one of those you know, 2% Sanders Trump voters. Uh, you know, my policy platform is all Bernie Sanders. But when I have a choice between, you know, breaking up the system and what I think are the, the, the overly comfortable way things work in Washington, or choosing someone who is, you know, Hillary Clinton, basically sane, has good policies, sensible, uh, you know, I, I wanted to break the log down. Uh, now, I'm concerned, in the book, I talk about three traditions in American politics, progressive, conservative, and liberal. I say, I'm all three. Uh, but you know, then I think you say one, there's a fourth one too. What's your fourth one? You said you, you said there were well, you said there were three forms of sovereignty. three traditions, three corners: progressive, conservative, and liberal. And it used to be that liberals were in both parties. You know the the party machinery in both parties. Those who run the party, the you know the the apparatchiks, the the lawyers who run the parties. They, they've always been liberal in mindset, even in the Republican Party. But starting in the 1970s, there was a dramatic shift. And that all of the liberals ended up in the Democratic Party. And as a result, the progressives have been you know, squ squished in the Democratic Party, quashed in the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party has become effectively a liberal party. And I think it's gone too far. Now, look, I'm in favor of liberalism in places like you know, Russia and Hungary that are you know, not liberal enough. What's the difference enough. between liberal and progressive then? Oh, liberalism is, is, liberalism is the idea, is, is a, a philosophy of governance based on rights and freedoms, uh, based on the idea that we should have uh, sound policies that uh, operate according to the rule of law, uh, that, you know, well, liberalism is the house philosophy of the expert class. It, it's the idea that we should have sensible politics run in a rational way. You know, the whole, the very word liberal has its roots in libertas and freedom. And so protecting people's freedoms and you know, later morphing into a philosophy of rights. And, and I believe in that. But I'm also conservative. I think if we have institutions that have worked well for a long time, we should respect them. We should abide by them. I'm very respectful of religion. 
the difference between uh, liberalism and progressivism. We only have a couple minutes left. Oh, and progressivism uh, is the idea that we should have policies that benefit ordinary working people. You know, the Progressive Party in the United States, when we had one, and the Progressive Democrats who've challenged the uh, centrist, you know, liberal leadership of the Democratic Party, people like, you know, Bernie Sanders, you know, AOC, you know, have, have been talking about uh, policies that would dramatically shift the distribution of income in the United States towards ordinary working people. And I very much promote or very much agree with those uh, kinds of progressive policies. Uh, you know, it's all a matter of balance and we need a little of each of these, right? And I'm not going to say that if my side's not winning, it's undemocratic. You know, I want democracy and I want us to go into the public sphere and talk about it. Look, I know we don't have much time. Can I give you a quote from Winston Churchill? Sure. Okay. Winston Churchill is always quoted as saying, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. And people chuckle and they say, well, you know, democracy isn't so great, but, you know, all the others are worse. No one ever quotes the rest of his speech. The rest of his speech is, but there is the broad feeling in our country that the people should rule, continuously rule, and that public opinion expressed by all constitutional means should shape, guide, and control the actions of ministers who are their servants and not their masters. That, Trump, that, that, that Churchill quote, was not at all about how democracy is a problem, but we've got to live with it. His message was that democracy is fantastic and we should embrace it. Well, that's, that's a, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, and that's in the book too. What, what that's the final quote of the book. What's the, that's the final quote of the, all right, I'm gonna, can I, I'm gonna put that into this, uh, when I put it up on op-ed news, I'll add that to it. That's a great quote. Yeah, that's and and you're right. Nobody adds that part of it. Nobody adds that part. So we've got a wrap. We've got one minute left. Anything you want to finish with? Look, all I want is for people to respect other people. All, all I want is for us to say, you know, when someone disagrees with us, for us to say, you know what? I disagree with you, but you're an American too. You're a voter too. You're a human being too. Yeah. And I should respect your opinion even if I disagree with it. Don't call people racist, don't call people homophobes, don't call people all sorts of dirty words, don't call them Nazis. You know, just accept that you know, 99.9% .9 of Americans are pretty much okay, and we can trust them. You know, right. if, if I'm in trouble, I want an American on my side. You're right, and my guest for this show has been Salvador Babonis the author of The New Authoritarianism, Trump Populism and the Tyranny of Experts. Thanks so much for being on the show. Well, thanks a lot, Rob.